Good morning to you all. I do welcome you to our Wednesday service, midweek service. And uh, I just think uh, God is going to speak something to, you, to your life. Uh, God is going to say something to your soul today. And so you better just listen carefully to hear what God is going to say. Let us pray. Come, let us enter the land of, that God has prepared for us. Our days of wandering in the barren desert are at an end. Hungry and thirsty, we cry out in deep despair. As in the waters of our baptism, we cross over the Jordan. The land is fertile and rich with good rain and season. God leads the way. Make our footsteps sure. The harvest is bountiful. We dwell in the land God has prepared for us. And we are here today, marching over, crossing over to the promised land. May the good Lord be with us. In your name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother Ben to come and read from the book of Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Good day to you all, and uh, it's another beautiful day. Uh, Today we'll be looking into the life of Joshua in Joshua 3. It's about uh, when they crossed the Jordan. So early in the morning Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know uh, you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about two thousand cubits before you uh, between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will, do, will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites and Gershonites, Amorites and Jebusites. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribe of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zareth, Zarathan. While the waters were flowing down to the Sea of Ar Arabah, that is, the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So, so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had complete, completed the crossing on dry land. And this is the word of the Lord. Amazing story. Just shows how uh, amazing our God is. So we'll get Johnson back up here to share his message this week for this uh, scripture verse. Thanks, Johnson. Uh, our theme today 
face filling Moses' shoes. Filling Moses' shoes. What will they do now? Moses had died, and nobody even knows where he has been buried. Moses is the one who had led the people of Israel out of Egypt. And along the way in the wilderness, now he's dead. And what happens next? Maybe Moses' burial our place was kept a secret so that the people wouldn't hang around this grave wringing their hands over the loss of their leader. So the people have no time for self-pity. They are still on the wrong side of the Jordan. The journey is not yet complete. They are on their way to the land of the promise God has promised them. But they aren't there yet. They need to move on. But how? Who will lead them? Who could possibly fill Moses' shoes? Some people are impossible to replace when they go. A leader like Moses doesn't come along every day. Moses had been larger than life. He was a great lawgiver who had brought the commandments themselves down from Mount Sinai. With God's help, he had taken on Pharaoh, the powerful ruler of Egypt, and won. Moses had the waters of the Sea of Reyes stand up in heaps so that the people could cross on dry land. Moses had intervened with God to save the people. Moses had actually seen God with his own eyes. But how could anyone fill those shoes? How could anyone fill those shoes? Joshua has shown promise. He led the fight with Amalek at Raphidim. In Exodus 17, verse 8 to 13. Even there, he needed Moses' help. Through some way, the narrator doesn't explain. By holding up his arms or having someone hold them. Moses is able to influence the battle of Raphidim. So even in his great victory, Joshua needed Moses' help. Still, he has shown potential. Joshua distinguished himself as a spy helping to scope out Canaan before the rest of the people get there. So when the people are about to chicken out of going into Canaan, Joshua implores them to have faith in God. In Numbers 14, verse 6 to 10. Joshua is a lot going for him. So the question is, can Joshua take over for Moses? Moses has been the leader all along. So when the people ran out of food, water, and patience, Moses taken care of, of these things. So he has dealt with snakes and cooperative kings and the people's own unfaithfulness. Moses has carried them through. Can Joshua take them from there? Can he take them from here? Won't they face just as many hardships once they actually get into Canaan? Don't major battles lie ahead. Won't the people even more anxious and so more prone to idolatry now that Moses has died. They still have to make it cross across the Jordan River. They, can Joshua gain their confidence, see them through, and get the job done? Can Joshua do that? According to the narrator, Joshua didn't get much choice. The land announced the obvious that Moses was dead. And he then told Joshua to get going. He was to be the new leader. For his part, Joshua is a man of few words. He doesn't protest or try to pass the job on to someone else, as the great Moses did. So we don't ever get to know Joshua as well as we did Moses. But he seems to accept the responsibility without all of the whining that the Lord had put up with Moses. Joshua doesn't wear his feelings on his sleeve. When the Lord tells him what to do in chapter 1, he just does it. So the Lord does make Joshua a promise. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you, nor forsake you. That is what the promise is in Joshua 1 verse 5. And again he was given this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Which means you are supposed to read the Bible. You are supposed to read the word of God. That's a great promise, but the Lord's presence hasn't kept them out of trouble so far. 
They've made it through everything, but it hasn't been easy. So Joshua, the one trying to fill most enormous sandals, sent before the Jordan River. He is the first real test of his leadership. Everyone is watching to see what will happen. If everyone gets drained or half the food gets too soggy to eat, everyone will remember. So the Lord has promised to be with Joshua, just as yes, Lord, the Lord has promised to be with Moses. So that's a start anyway. Joshua gives the direction to the priests and the people. With the priest in front, Israel prepares to cross the Jordan. The way it was supposed to work was that when the feet of the priest hit the river, the water would recite, just like at the Red Sea, Sea of Reeds. So what went through everyone's mind? Were they wondering if it would work again? Were they all, especially the priests in front, wishing that Moses was still there? Perhaps with some mix of faith and doubt, the priests dipped their feet into the water. Then it happened. Just as it had in the good old days of Moses, so the water drew back and stood up in a heap. The people crossed over on dry ground, just as their mothers and fathers had at the Sea of Reeds. Maybe this Joshua is the right stuff after all. So Joshua was a strong leader in battle, a man of faith, quicker to obey God than Moses had been. But Joshua never got the recognition that Moses did. The Deuteronomy says of Moses, Deuteronomy 34 verse 10, Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Which means Joshua was never recognized like Moses. It's not just Deuteronomy. The psalmist and other Old Testament authors sing Moses' praises but so not much about Joshua. See Psalm 103, Nehemiah chapter 9. Moses mentioned in the New Testament almost eight times. Joshua only three times. Moses is present in the transfiguration. Joshua is not. So everyone from C to B, D mile to Disney has done an interpretation of Moses at the Sea of Reeds. But Joshua crossing the Jordan has never made, been made a big screen. Joshua is like the young cleric who has to follow a beloved pulpit giant at a high steeple church. You know, if you follow someone who is good at a church, you know you're in trouble. Because everyone will be comparing you to the person, to your predecessor. During the days of so and so, during the days of so and so, even after the person has left even 10, 20 years, they will be still mentioning that person. No matter what he accomplished, he's always going to be compared to his predecessor. So when you get down into it, though is Joshua's accomplishment just as important as Moses' accomplishment. So Moses had the transient experience of leading the people out of Egypt. That part of the mission was certainly uplifting. Getting out of a bad place is great relief. Getting out of the hospital, even if we face a long rehab, is a great feeling. So getting started on a long journey or a process is exciting. Some people go back to school in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, even in 50s or 60s. It's a great experience to start something very new adventure. Some people decide to tackle a social issue or a problem. They often begin with a burst of energy. When we start school or a new diet or a music lessons or a project to register some voters or to tackle some social issues, it's a great time. The finishing line is really the exhilarating part, though it isn't. Graduating from school, meeting our target weight, getting some new piece of legislation passed, exceeding a fundraising goal, those are the real thrill. Most of the people started, but Joshua finished the job. So Israel would not have been Israel without Joshua. And the crossing of the Jordan. Without this story, the ragtag behind of Hebrew slaves who left in Egypt would fizzle out in the wilderness since Moses was dead. All of the 40 years of wandering would have been for nothing. 
God's great journey may have begun with Moses, but Joshua brought it home. It was Joshua who finished it. So God worked through Joshua as much as through Moses. So God works through us as well. Maybe you are saying, what, what, what are you trying to bring to us? I'm trying to bring this to you today. That Moses can, God can work through you today. As he worked through Moses and Joshua. In order to do his job, the church needs leaders. Sometimes we don't see ourselves in those leadership roles. Surely someone else could head the committees, teach the Sunday schools, lead worship, raise the church budget, or even take care of the building and grounds better than we could. Some of the jobs in the church don't seem that glamorous or bring much recognition. Still, these jobs, small as they may seem, are part of God's work. As an example, let's take Sunday school teachers. Sometimes we stand on the threshold of the Sunday school room, just as Joshua stood at the Jordan River. What will happen when we take the next step? Will the class go well? Have I prepared enough? Sometimes, though, we walk into the class and see how God is working through us. Sometimes we see ignorance or resistance to the message pushed aside, like the waters of Jordan, so that the light comes through. Every person has encouraged parishioners, has encountered parishioners who have been in the church all of their lives, but still don't know the basic stories of the Bible. If we don't know the Bible, don't know the stories of faith, we can miss what it means to be the church. Teaching is an easy work. It takes time and to prepare. It takes time to prepare, and you are preparing for some people who don't even know one story of the Bible. It can be intimidating. It gets old doing it week after week. Nevertheless, Sunday school teachers step up to the challenge. The church could not be the church without them. In spite of the difficult, what they usually find is that God is with them. God works through them. I read a story in a United Methodist bishop from North Texas Conference. William Oden tells of his fifth uh, grade boys Sunday school class in Sean Ohama. So the group of old boys had run off the last two Sunday school teachers. The next victim was to be a man named Louis Cooper, a railroad engineer. He told the group of boys that he did not know much about the Bible, but that they would learn it together. Bishop Oden says that he can still see Cooper's rough hands lovingly turning the pages of the Bible as he taught. Cooper stayed with the boys for three years, fifth year, sixth year, and seventh grades. Out of that class of troublemakers came three clergy, one of whom was a bishop, a, theo a theology professor, a conference lay leader. God worked through a railroad engineer, even if he didn't feel prepared for what God called him to do. So God can work through all of us. God may call us to a variety of ministries that are demanding or that don't bring much recognition. Responding to that call may fill us with uncertainty. If we answer God's call, we will feel what God is with us. What God may accomplish through us may surprise us. Let us take the next step and see where God is leading us. May God help you. Take the responsibility. God is calling you for something more. Don't run away from God's call. A lot of people run away from God's call. They think it is for others. Yes, it is God who is calling them either into ministry, either into something to do. God doesn't call you for nothing. He calls you to do something. So respond to God's call. May God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful things you have done in and through Israel, in and through the church. Thank you for the way you have guided and directed their lives and the lives of all your people. You help us to carry out the good work that you have prepared for us to do in the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that we may be consecrated to you in thought, word and deed. For you, a great and mighty God, this I pray in Jesus' name. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Thank you, Father. In your name I pray.
Amen. Let us receive grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.